Good. Hey, welcome to Florida. <laughs> Hope you enjoy your time here. It was a free flight. Isn't that fantastic? You guys loving this humidity? Yeah. It's fun, huh? Just convince yourself of that. You'll get through it. Somebody said this morning it's an advertisement for hell. <laughs> it, it feels bad. Anyway, let me pray and we'll jump in. God, thanks this morning. Thanks for your word. It's living and active and relevant today, even in our lives, God, and in the details of our lives. And Father, even when we don't feel like we want to hear them, when we don't feel like we want to follow them, uh, God, you're patient with us and uh, waiting for us to come back to you and uh, put them into practice, put your principles into practice in every detail of our life because you truly want to bless us, encourage us, provide and protect us as well. And so God, I pray that you speak to us this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, if you want to fascinate a child... With a great story, there's no better thing to do than make that child the central character of a story. Nearly 100 years ago, a little boy in England received a stuffed bear for a gift on his first birthday. Soon after, his father, who's a, a playwright, novelist, and uh, he began writing stories featuring his little boy, his bear, and other toys in the boy's playroom as characters. You know this bear as Winnie the... And you know the boy as... Yeah, a hundred years later, we all know this story as well. Since then, Winnie the Pooh uh, stories have been loved by generations of children, including my own children, including me as a child, translated into more than 50 languages and featured in songs, movies, and television specials. And it all began with a little boy, a stuffed bear, as characters in a simple story. Now, all of us this morning, we all have a story. Maybe your story is a tragedy. Maybe yours reads like a comedy, or a mystery, or maybe a romance. Some are longer than others, some are shorter than others, but we all have a story. And this morning we're going to look into an incredible story, it's God's big story. And as we immerse into God's story, we'll find our place, we'll find our chapter that was written about us in the midst of God's bigger story. Each week this month in September, uh, you'll see a short video clip from the History Channel's Bible miniseries to help us visualize and experience the story, God's big story. Now, the Bible miniseries aired originally on the History Channel this spring, and we have about a dozen viewing parties, as Laura mentioned, that are, are meeting in groups and watching the whole series. It said 10 parts. There are 10 parts each week. These groups are watching two parts, so it'll be five weeks long, and that's how long this sermon series is as well. So my prayer for you this month is that you'll maybe see uh, these Bible stories in a whole new light, in a whole different way than you have before. My prayer is that you'll gain better appreciation for God's redemptive plan through His Son, Jesus Christ. And my prayer is that you experience greater insight into God's love, his passionate, pursuing love of you. Now, this morning, we're going to look at a story in the first book of the Bible, which is called Genesis. Genesis. Yes, it's a powerful story that, as a father, I've always had a hard time comprehending and looking into this story. It's, it's emotional. It's tough. So let's start by looking at uh, a short video clip, and then we will get into the text in the Bible. So let's, let's, uh, let's look at this uh, clip. Isn't that powerful? Intense, intense. As a father, again, that, that just disturbs me all the time when I consider that. Now, I want to encourage you as we go through this series, as we watch these clips, or if you're in a, a group and you're watching through the, the mini-series itself, I want to encourage you to keep your critical thinking hats on because um, as you look at these clips, is not exactly what's in the Bible. And the cool thing about that is I'm hoping that forces you to look into Scripture and see what it actually says. Now, they're not really changing many of the, the deep and important principles, but at the same time, you need to go to Scripture for everything even, even when you're hearing me or, or, or Dr. Bob or any other pastor or preacher teach the Word of God, that's no substitute for you going directly to the text and reading the Bible on your own. So my prayer and hope for you is that you get into the Scripture. There's amazing stories in there 
for you to read and to learn from, and that uh, your Bible reading just isn't limited to 30 minutes on Sunday morning once a week. So we're going to look into uh, this story right now, chapter 22 in Genesis. If you've got your Bibles, you can pull that out and turn there. And we also have uh, sermon notes in the bulletin that you can pull out and follow along, and, and there are some fill-in-the-blanks there available for you to help with your uh, memorization and study. Now, some of us have read this story and have heard it many times, and it's a story of great faith, the story of a father who was so obedient to God that he was willing to do the unimaginable to slay his own son. Um, and it's usually told from, uh, from Abraham's perspective. But this morning, we're going to look at it from Isaac's perspective and uh, check out that approach and imagine what Isaac went through. Because the story of Isaac, is actually, is, is just, it's not just the story of Isaac, it's the story of you. It's the story of me. It's the story of all of us. And so the first fill-in, number one, is um, my life is an uncertain journey. As Isaac's was, our lives, my life, is an uncertain journey. So let's read. We're going to read uh, verses 1 through 8 to begin. It says, Sometime later, God tested, tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and saddled his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son, Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. Now, this is really interesting. Uh, Pay attention to this sentence, guys. It says, uh, we will worship and then who will come back? What does it say? Does he say, I will come back? No, it says, we will come back to you. That's the faith of Abraham that God is going to provide. Verse 6, Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. So put yourself now in Isaac's shoes or more appropriately, his sandals. Apparently, one day, his father said, hey, we're going to go on a father-son camping trip. Let's go. We're going to go up on top of Mount Moriah and and hang out and have some good bonding time. And they took two servants with them. Now, it was a trip of about 50 miles, which was about a two-day walk to get there, and they, they finally reached it on the third day. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us how much Isaac knew, if anything, about what his father had in mind. While the clip we just watched depicted him as a a young boy, he was probably more like a young man at the time. Now, it's clear that there was much Isaac didn't understand, and he he probably would have stayed behind if he would have known. He would have said, you know what, Dad, I think I'm going to hang out with my friends at Disneyland today. I'm not going to Mount Moriah with you. Sorry, you're on your own. But his dad, he, he didn't reveal to him the purpose of this trip, and it just didn't make sense to to Isaac, which is why he asked, you know, where's the lamb, dad? Where's the lamb for the the burnt offering that we should have with us? Now, that's true of your life as well. It's true of mine, too. We're all on a journey like Isaac, and it's an uncertain journey. We don't understand, and we can't control everything in our lives, and life is uncertain, And we simply need to trust our Heavenly Father. And and as a dad of young kids, that can scare me big time for my own kids. When I see the world and where we're going and and the landscape of our country, I feel like I just want to protect my kids of an uncertain future for them. And I'm sure maybe your heart has yearned. If you've got kids, you've yearned for them. Or maybe younger siblings, you've felt the same thing, that you just want to protect and you want to hold and you want to control their future. But you know what? Then God reminds me that my kids are not my kids, they're his kids, on loan to me for a temporary stewardship. I'm here to parent them, to invest in them, to love on them, to Lord willing lead them to Christ. 
but they're God's children, and I'm preparing them for adulthood and a life with him. Now, when I look at the rose over there, how baby James was born, and that's a great name, by the way, isn't it? Fantastic. (laughs) His life has just begun this past week, but it's an uncertain future. Like Isaac in this story, all of our futures are uncertain. Ecclesiastes 10.14 says, No one knows what is coming. Who can tell him what will happen after him? None of us knows what's coming, no matter how much you think you know, no matter how educated you are, no matter how much money and power that you may possess. Your future, like mine, is uncertain. And that's one way in which Isaac's story is like our story. But there's another way. Number two is my death appears certain. That's number two, the second fill-in. My death appears certain. Let's look at the text again and and read verses 9 and 10. It says, When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. Can you imagine, can you, can you put your, yourself in Isaac's spot for a moment and imagine his uh, astonishment, his fear, like, Dad, what's, what's gotten into you? What is going on? What is happening right now? You know, whether he was eight or, or 18 years old, he must have been going through just a, a, a huge, huge discord in his own mind with his loving father about to slay him. You know, did Abraham explain to him what what happened? Did, did, he, did he completely surprise him? Did Isaac resist at all? The text doesn't say. We don't know for sure. But it seems at some point, Isaac knew what was about to happen to him. At some point, he realized that his death was certain. And while the biblical account doesn't give us much detail about how things got to this point, it does say that Abraham raised the knife high, ready to drive it into his son and slay him. Now, some of you have had such a moment as well, whether perceived a reality, you thought you were on the brink, and maybe you were on the brink of death. Anybody been there? I've, I know I've been there at least twice that I'm aware of, that I felt this is it. I'm, I'm done. I remember specifically when I was four or five years old, I was walking in the woods with my parents on a dirt road, and this biggest deer in the whole world, I was four or five, so any deer was huge, but it ran like full tilt past me and missed me like by an inch. Full tilt out of the woods. And that was the first time I felt like, wow, I almost died. You know, maybe you've had a cancer scare. Maybe you've had, you know, a close call in a, in a car accident or, or an operation. Uh, I had a, one of these moments um, yesterday. I was in Corona with my in-laws, and we were eating breakfast at the Silver Dollar Pancake House in Corona, and I looked up on the shelf behind me where I was sitting, and you know what I saw in a pancake house? I saw a little shelf with an urn sitting on it. Kind of bizarre, but it just hit home that I'm enjoying this blueberry waffle, and I'm enjoying connecting with my family and my in-laws, and then, oh yeah, that's where I'm going. I'm going to be dust again. I'm going back to the earth one day. And it just hit me like big time. And uh, the funny thing on this urn is that it had some words on it. And I looked at it close and, and, and then I read them. It said, contains the ashes of problem customers. <laughs> Can you believe that? <laughs> And uh, it's working because it took uh, 45 minutes to get a seat in that place. (laughs) Well, Isaac's story is yours. It's mine. It's all of ours. Our future is uncertain and and death is certain. Romans 5.12 says, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, in this way sin and death came to all men because all sinned. Ever since the first humans ate the forbidden fruit in the garden, ever since they ignored God's warning and did things their own way, we have all gone astray. We have all rejected God's ways and have chosen our own way repeatedly over and over. And the awful consequence of sin that, that touches us all is death. 
And that awaits us all as well. You know, there's a scene in the Bible miniseries where uh, it's the Exodus scene. If you remember that, where Moses is leading the the people of God out of Egypt. and, And Moses has to explain the final plague to his own people. And he tells them, death is coming for us all. If you remember, the angel of death moved throughout Egypt. Now, it's true. You may not be tied hand and foot and placed on an altar, but the angel of death is not going to come to your house, but death is going to come to you eventually. We're all destined to be dust sooner or later. It's depressing, isn't it? Welcome to church. (laughs) Well, it does get better. God doesn't leave us hanging there. God is a God of love. And before we can truly appreciate that, though, we need to understand the reality of the bad news. Death is coming for us all. Every single one of us is facing physical death, just like Isaac did, stare it right in the face. It's not a question of if it's coming. It's only a question of when. And it may come sooner if you're unruly at the Silver Dollar Pancake House. So just be careful when you go to Corona and go to the Silver Dollar Pancake House. Now, we all know our time on earth is limited. We all know that the human condition is terminal. It's a, uh, death is batting 100%, okay? There's no chance we're all not getting out alive. We can only hope, though, that it's not today, that it's not happening soon. You know, we all feel like we have forever and a long time, but in reality, none of us knows when that time is going to come. Ecclesiastes 9.12 says, Moreover, no man knows when his hour will come. But happily, this is not the full story. This is not the end of the story. Or at least it doesn't have to be the end of your story. Because there's one more way that Isaac's story is the same as our story. And number three is my salvation has been provided. The word is provided. Remember, Abraham has bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar. He has lifted the knife to kill his son. And let's read on and see how the text plays out, starting in verse 11. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up, and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering. The next word is huge. What's the next word? Sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead. Let's all say that word, instead. Instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day, it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. Now, isn't it interesting in verse 12, if you look back in verse 12, it says, you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Did Abraham have more than one son? Do any of you know? What was his other son's name? Ishmael. Now, why would the text say your only son? Well, it's because Isaac was the promised son. God said, I'm going to give you a son, even in your old, old age. I'm going to provide a son for you, the promised son. And Ishmael was the son of Hagar, which was Sarah's Egyptian maidservant. Sarah didn't trust that God would give her a son because her and Abraham were so old. So she said, Abraham, sleep with Hagar. But Isaac, Isaac was the promised son that God provided the only promised son. Now, I want to show you an interesting chart. If you, if you turn to the back and, and look at the bottom there, uh, it's an incredible outline, and it compares the, the story of the binding of Isaac and the story of Christ as a sacrifice for the nations. And the, the binding of, of Isaac really predicts and is a foreshadow of what's to come in Christ. It's amazing how similar these stories are. If you look down here, there's an only begotten son. There's uh, someone offered on a mountain or a hill. And the interesting thing is that scholars suggest that it's the exact same place where Isaac was bound and almost sacrificed. That's where Christ was hung on the cross, the exact same place. They, t- they took a donkey to place to the place of sacrifice. Two men went with them 
Two men hung on the cross with Christ. Three-day journey and three days in the grave. The son carried what? What does it say? Carried wood. What did Christ carry? He carried wood. He carried his own cross on his back up a hill. And then finally, God provided what? God provided the lamb. Now you can read the rest of it, but it's, there's just too many similarities not to see that this is not just coincidental. And get this, Abraham lived 1,800 years prior to Christ, and yet you can see clearly that this is a precursor, and he's like a type or foreshadow of Christ. Well, let's get back to our story. Can you imagine what Isaac was going through? And can you imagine uh, the relief after the angel stopped his dad from what he was about to do. Once again, put yourself in Isaac's shoes. The knife was raised, and and Isaac probably closed his eyes. Maybe he braced himself, and he just waited for the next moment for that knife to pierce his body, and maybe for his last breath. And then the angel of the Lord spoke up. He told Abraham to hold off, and the next thing you know, a ram appears tangled in the bushes nearby. A ram, a sacrificial animal, to take his place instead of Isaac. It would be the ram. It was a substitute, and Isaac was saved. You know that's our story as well. It can be our story. You may not be physically bound hand and foot, but like all of us, you know what it feels like to be tied up in sin, or you know what it feels like to to be affected by somebody else's sin towards you. Romans 6.23 says, the wages of sin is, when you do a lot of sin, you get death. When you do any sin, the wages is death. But your story doesn't end there. It doesn't have to end there. The more, and, and more than Isaac, any more than Isaac's story ended on Mount Moriah. Because just as he did for Isaac, God provides salvation for you. He provides salvation for for me. He provides a substitute, a lamb. And as I mentioned, uh, God provided the lamb on the very spot where the ram was caught in the thicket. A prophetic fulfillment to verse 14 where it said, uh, we just read it, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. Salvation will be provided. And that's what John the Baptist meant when he went uh, by the Jordan River and he announced to everyone in John Chapter 1, verse 29, it says, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The Lamb of God, the sacrificial Lamb. God provided that for you. He provided that for me. He provided that for the world. Can you picture Isaac climbing down from the altar? What do you think he was thinking? What would you be thinking as you climbed off that altar? What emotions do you think flooded his body in that moment. What do you think he did in in response to understanding what was about to happen, but what did not happen? You see, it doesn't say, but, but I'd guess Isaac dropped to his knees in tears. He probably worshiped God and thanked him for providing a substitute. That's the kind of response that's appropriate for all of us to God as he has provided a substitute. He has provided Christ to hang on a cross instead of you, instead of me. You see, God loves you so much that he provided Christ to die on a cross. If you choose to accept him, he will forgive you. He will have peace with you. You will get the blessing of heaven. And you know what? If you don't have a relationship with God, if you're not a follower of Christ, if you're not a Christian, You can cross that line of faith in a moment because God knows your heart and he wants to forgive you and he wants to provide Christ as a substitute instead of you. All you have to do is simply admit you're a sinner, believe that Christ died for you, and choose to follow Christ. A, B, C, admit you're a sinner, believe that Christ died for you as a substitute because you and I deserve to hang on that cross and then choose to follow Christ, to reorient your life around Christ. Instead of you being the Lord of your life, you look to Christ and what he calls you to do as a husband, as a wife, as a sibling, as a son, as a daughter, 
as a grandparent, whatever case you find yourself in. I want to pray a simple prayer right now in, in gratitude to God for salvation that he has provided us in Christ. If you're a Christ follower, this is simply a prayer of gratitude, a reminder of what God has provided. If you're not a follower of Christ, if these words represent the desire of your heart, then God will save you in a moment from the effects of your sin. And you'll have peace with God and you'll literally become a new creation in Christ. So I want to invite you, I want to invite all of you to stand with me and we're going to pray this. I'm going to I'm going to say a few words and then if you can repeat that prayer. So all eyes closed and heads bowed and and let's pray. Lord God, thank you for providing my salvation. Thank you for the spotless Lamb of God who was given to take away the sins of the world. I confess that I am a sinner like everyone else here. I turn to you and accept Jesus' sacrifice on the cross as payment for my sins. I ask you to take charge of my life from this moment on. In Jesus' name, and all God's people say, Amen. Amen. You may be seated, you guys. Now, if you prayed that prayer for the first time, I would love to know about it. Please come up to me. I'm going to be on the patio following this service. Come and tell me. I'd love to pray for you personally. I'd love to, to help you in your walk with Christ as you grow in Christ. And, and that's why we come to church, because we come here, because we're all a bunch of sinners needing support from each other to continually grow in our relationship with Christ. And if you are a follower of Christ, I want to encourage you during September, during this series, you need to go out and invite your oikos to church. What is oikos? Oikos is a Greek word that stands for the people that God has strategically and supernaturally placed around you. Typically, most of us have about 8 to 15-ish people that we see on a regular basis that don't have a relationship with Christ that God calls you to connect with. God calls you to step out in obedience and in an act of faith, just like Abraham trusted God enough. You need to go out and be willing to invite somebody to church, to invite them to come and hear the hope that they're desperate to know about. You're not responsible for their response, whether they come or not, but you need to be prayed up. You need to go and invite and so the ushers on your way out, they're going to have cards. You have one invite card in your bulletin, but take as many as you need, pass them out, and you simply have to say, hey, our church is doing the History Channel Bible miniseries, the thing that was on in the spring that millions and millions of people across this country enjoyed. We're doing it as a church. Do you want to come? And hand them one. And make a specific invite and say, hey, I'll meet you there. I'll meet you there at 10 to 11. Service starts at 11. I'll walk in with you. I'll show you where to check your kids in. And it'll be fun. Don't worry. We're not too weird. Well, I'm weird, but the rest of them are kind of normal. <laughs> Have fun with it, okay? And invite somebody to church next week and the following week. That's your responsibility. You're not responsible for their response. Let me pray a prayer of blessing on you as you consider that. And as you go and invite God, I pray for my friends. I pray that you give them courage. I pray that you'd give them the faith that Abraham had, that you are with them, no matter what they feel, no matter maybe how embarrassed they are or how shy they are. God, those are just feelings, and we don't worship feelings, God. We worship the true God of the universe. And Father, I pray that you'd give us all emotional fortitude so that we can completely trust in you and go out there and take the risk and invite somebody to church. And God, the first time we do it, we're going to realize that we, we're still breathing <laughs> when we've done that. Our heart is still beating. The world's still turning. We're going to live. We're going to survive that ask. But God, give us the faith and the courage to simply invite somebody to church. And I pray your hand a blessing upon my friends as they go out to invite. God, thank you for sending your son to die on a cross in our place instead of us. In Jesus' name, amen.